so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. Then you can check out our latest blog post, you can look at our latest podcast, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you go through this message, I pray that God works life change into your life, and welcome to Church on the Rock. So a couple of weeks ago, I was up at 5 o'clock in the morning studying the Scripture. Now, if you think I'm bragging, I'm going to tell you that doesn't happen very often, so don't think. Uh, but it just, you know, it just so happened that this morning I was, and I, read a, and I read a scripture, and it was Ephesians 5. One through two. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And I read that scripture, and, I, and man, it quickened in my spirit. And I said, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God, a fragrant offering. And it just quickened in my spirit. And I said, there, there's a message there somewhere. Now, normally, I'm, I'm just, anymore, I'm just a, a blank screen. And until God gives him the message, I, I don't have anything. I used to think I had something to say, and anymore I don't have anything to say. And thank you, Lord, for using me as a vessel of clay. Uh, and this morning, as you can tell, as you can hear, I'm, I'm sick. I've been sick since Wednesday. But I wanted to, to bring the message. Roger called me, not uncoincidentally, about three hours after I read that scripture. And he said, he said, I want you to preach on February 14th. And I said, okay. And I said, in fact, I think I have a word. And, and he said, okay. Now, I've got to give Roger a little bit of credit. I'm going to give Roger credit. I'm going to give the Lord credit. Because I, I, I had a lot of people complimenting me for the morning service this morning at 830. And bragging said, what a great message it was. Frankly, I didn't feel like I did well at all. It was disjointed and jumbled, and my thoughts weren't there, which means God gets all the credit because, you know, I'm, I'm a weak vessel at that. So if I have anything to say, it's got to be God's anointing this morning. But I'm going to brag a little bit on Roger because when I read that scripture, I started thinking of one of his messages and that was the woman who broke the alabaster jar of, of expensive nard to anoint Jesus before his death. And you remember Roger's message on that. Roger's sermon was that Jesus would, would on the cross, he, he, he could smell it. Like, you know, and he's smelling and said, and remember what she had done. And it's Mark 14. Now, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him, but not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. And while he was in Bethany, reclined at the table at the home of, of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She didn't just take it out of the jar. I mean, she busted the jar to get all the fragrance out of it. And some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. Well, as I was preparing this message, I learned something that I didn't know, and Roger didn't know. It's funny, okay? I'm, you know, I've been serving God, Maurice, for 40 years. I've been probably you know, approaching 35 at this point. 
Here's Roger, another 30, 40 years. Isn't it funny how you can know, look at a scripture and find a new truth or a new meaning? You know, after all, what I didn't know was, Jesus said, I came to fulfill the law. Do you know that as a rabbi, he would have been violating the law had he been buried and his body not been anointed for burial? And he knew that when they come to, when they come to anoint my body and prepare my body, I'm not going to be there, so I've got to do it beforehand. And he, was, he said, I came to fulfill every jot and every tittle of the law. Now, that's just an aside because that has nothing to do with the message today, but that may be for somebody. But what, um, what I want to talk about is the aroma that is, that is released to God in the crushing process. Not only of the alabaster jar, yes, that's true, as the jar was broken and that aroma was released on Jesus, and as he hung on the cross, he could smell it in his hair and smell it in his beard and smell it on his robe, and he would just, and he'd remember and say, this is why I'm doing this. But more than that, Isaiah 53.10 Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. It was the Lord's will to crush Jesus. So now also the prophet Isaiah, when he talks about, for your transgressions was he wounded. For your sins was he pierced. He was bruised for your iniquities. And on him was laid the sin of all of us. And that Jesus did it willingly. So what what does that mean? Leviticus 17... Six. Let me give you just an example. Because I want to focus on the aroma that's produced from the crushing process. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, in which, and, and obviously we could spend days on the Old Testament sacrificial system which says without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sins. That's God's law, it's not ours. But for a sacrifice to be made, a sacrifice means there always has to be the giving up of something. You have to offer something that you would not normally offer or it doesn't become a sacrifice. Remember David David said, I, I'm going to buy, I'm going to pay you for the oxen and the mule and the threshing floor. He said, he said, I, I, heaven forbid that I should offer something to God that doesn't cost me something. And that's what a sacrifice is. So in the Old Testament, every day the high priest and the priest of the temple would offer bulls and goats and turtle doves and they cut their throats and shed the blood, and then they would slay them, and the fire would be continuously going, and they'd throw it on the grill. Not the grill. (laughs) They'd throw it on the altar. Well, you laugh. You laugh, but Leviticus 17.6, the priest is to sprinkle the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and burn the fat as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. That's the grill. That's my barbecue. That's the neighbors who barbecue chicken, and there's not a better smell in the world than the aroma of barbecuing chicken that's, that's caught on the breeze that comes over, and I just go, oh, my gosh, I want barbecue chicken. Or when I come home and... And my son-in-law is barbecuing hamburgers. 
And you open the door and that smell, that aroma has filled the house. And, and your mouth starts watering and you just drink it in. You say, oh, gosh, that smells good. Oh, I love that smell. I can remember as a kid when my dad would fire up the grill, he'd take garlic salt and he'd just sprinkle it on the hot coals like that. And the aroma that was produced like that, I don't care. You could cook shoe leather and it would have been good. So it's the same thing with God. He loved those sacrifices. He loved those offerings. Well, as we know, Jesus became the Lamb of God. He became the last sacrifice. And so when Jesus offered himself, the sacrificial system was done away with. Now, not literally at that point, but the truth of the matter is that when the Romans conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD, there hasn't been a daily sacrifice in 2,000 years. That's really truly when it stopped. Well, God didn't diminish and do away with all those laws, all the stuff. He, he, he loves that stuff. It's an aroma pleasing to God. And, and we can't sacrifice Jesus again because we've already done it once. And the scriptures say, not by the blood of goats and bulls is there an offering, but by Jesus once he entered into the, the high temple. One time, one time only. Well, what? God's going to go 2,000 years without getting that aroma that's pleasing to him? No, it doesn't work that way. So that's what we're going to talk about. That there is an aroma that is produced by the crushing, by the sacrifice, by the willingly giving something up. Jesus, for example. When Jesus said, it's not my will, but thine, that was a sacrifice. And that's what, Jesus, that's what God said. Jesus became the sacrifice as an aroma that was pleasing to him. So when Jesus was saying, it's not my will, but my Father's will, God went, oh, man, that smells good. And when Jesus said, hey, you don't take my life, I give it. Don't you think I could call on my Father right now and he'd send 10,000 angels to deliver me? And God goes, Oh, man, that smells good. Let me give you an example. A friend of mine has a bay tree. I get bay leaves for cooking. <clears throat> Even with my bad sinuses, I can still smell that bay leaf. But when I break it, the aroma is intensified. But if I want to get all of it, that's there, buddy. When you, when you crush it, when you crush it, it gives an aroma. It produces, it produces an aroma that exceeds just just the box, opening the box, you smell it. But when you break it, you get all of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. This is Paul. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ 
and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him, the fragrance of the Lord. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one were the smell of death, and to the other, <clears throat> the fragrance of life. Life is when you walk into the house and there's bed, bread baking in the oven and there's a fire going in the fireplace and there's potpourri on the stove or a roast in the, in the crock pot and you get those aromas and those smells, that's life. And death is when you walk into a place that is full of stench and garbage and rot and filth. That's death. And we, as believers in Christ, are to give off the aroma and the fragrance of life. But how do we do that? Through the crushing and the breaking. Now, I don't fully understand that. I don't. But I'm going to give you a couple of clues. Paul said, but
vision is if you close your eyes, it's not even your mind's eye. It's you look and you see. It's like a chandelier. You look and I see it. Suspended three dimensional in space. I've had a couple of them. Thank you, Lord, for supernaturally revealing yourself to me in such a way. But this was my first one, and I had this vision, and I go, and I see it, and what it is, it's a piece of fruit on a snow covered mountaintop. Now, I talked about it so much that my best friend had it painted for me. And it's an artist's rendition. He gave this to me back in 2005. And he said it's called it The Vision of Roman and Grace. And, and this is an artist's rendition of what I saw. Now, I'm looking at it, and it means absolutely nothing. I'm going, So eventually, the vision went away. And I'm sitting there completely bewildered. And I'm not listening to the past, but I don't know you guys are doing um, I started fidgeting and fumbling, and they had folding chairs, and I looked in the folding chair in front of me, and I pulled out an order of service from the, from the morning worship, and I flipped on the back side of it, and it said, Notes from the Pastor. Big bold point. Are you going through a tough time? Question mark. Well, if so, just remember that fruit doesn't grow on the mountaintop. It grows in the valley. If you're going through a tough time, just remember that there's no life on the mountain. Oh, we love being on the mountaintop. We love going to the mountaintop where everything is wonderful and everything is perfect. And, and the sky is blue and the sun shining and you can see forever. And just, I love being on the mountaintop. And I'm a snow skier. I mean, I, I get into this. But the truth of the matter is, as you get higher and higher up that mountaintop, you get less and less vegetation. And pretty soon you get above the tree lines and there's no life at all. It's just snow and ice. It's beautiful, but nothing lives on the mountaintop. So if you go to the mountaintop, enjoy it while you're there. You're not going to be there long. There's no, you can't live on the mountaintop. In fact, if you're a mountain climber, Everest is called the death zone. You get up there, you can't stay there very long. You're going to die. Life is in the valley. And in the valley is where the fruit of life is produced. In the valley where there's trials and tribulations is where you learn peace that surpasses all understanding. Thanksgiving. Joy. Forgiveness. Mercy. Blessing. Against these things, no weapon formed will prosper. You see, it's in the valley where God teaches us the things of the fruit of the Spirit. And He said, This is where you're going to learn, is in the valley where life takes place. Occasionally, I'm going to let you go up to the mountaintop to give you a break. But don't expect to stay there. So, as I started thinking more and more about what God was trying to show me, I said, God, if Jesus, when he had the alabaster box broken open, if he had that alone, and then Jesus himself became the sacrifice for which the prayer was
midst of stuff. You don't understand how God can be in the midst of all this. You really don't. But there are times when through Christ, if we come in and offer a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips can be one word, or as Lori said, it can be a whole prayer. It's like taking that steak and throwing it on the grill. And that aroma rises to God in And he drinks it. And he said, yeah, I know you're suffering. I, I, I know you're sick in your body. I know you're going through the divorce. I, I, I know the creditors are calling and facing bankruptcy. You know where your, your power bill is coming from next month. I, 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 know, I know your daughter's off on drugs and, and living, living just a horrible life and, and you just you know, for her every day. I know all these things. But when you think me, when you understand that it's all part of God's process, and when you understand then all those scriptures have said, for we know that all things work together to the good, to those that love him and call him to his That we know we are, we are bruised, but we're never forsaken. He, he's never going to let you go. Never. And when we understand that the process of crushing and breaking is for our edification, then suddenly, suddenly it takes a long time. Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice, not something that we really want to give up, but something that we do when we want to. We make a sacrifice of it. So that we go, Jesus, I come to the Father for you, and I say, So try it with me. Just repeat after me because we're going to offer this sacrifice of praise. Praise team start coming forward. And we are going to have a specific offer call today uh, from Brenda and Eric for today. Over here. Uh, I need the elders to pray for Brenda. Uh, and the Lord will already pray for her. Help, help issue. Cindy and Tina specifically will come down to offer. They, they need a job, they need to work, and they pray about that. That's a mom. But let's offer God a sacrifice of praise and just repeat that for me. Thank you, Lord. Glory, Father. Honor, blessing. Again, we are so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message encouraged you in any way, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org and let us know about it. Those type of messages encourage us as we work throughout the week. While you're there, check out our latest podcast or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a blessed week.